Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Degree Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Every other week, I'll be posing sex questions, busting sex myths, and opening up our mailbox to answer your relationship conundrums. But in order to do this, I need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. Hello and welcome to The Real Sex Education. I'm Diggle Waits and I'm joined as always by accredited sex and relationship therapist Kate Campbell. Hello mum. Hello Diggs. In this podcast mum and I do a deep dive on any and all aspects related to sex and today we're going back to the very beginning. We've done all sorts, fingering, erectile difficulties, uh, pregnancy, pegging, polyamory. What I'm trying to say is we've done loads but we're going to do, because we haven't so far, virginity. Mum, let's lose it. That's easy. <laughs> uh, to, so to know what virginity is, we need to know what sex is, which is, seems like a mental question to ask. But mum, what is sex? Don't say mental. Sorry. It sounds like an absolutely insane question to ask. But what is sex? It can be whatever you want it to be. But an awful lot of people think that sex is only penis in vagina intercourse, which would mean that Anybody not having penis in vagina intercourse wouldn't be having sex. But of course, they are. Mm. And there are all sorts of things that you can consider to be sex. So obviously, any, anything that involves arousal is sexual. But, mm. it, but, but you know, there are sexual behaviours like looking in, in the mirror and thinking you look absolutely fantastic and being turned on by yourself, which a lot of people are. I wait for that mm. day myself, but, you know, a lot of people <laughs> experience it. Um, mm. you, you know, that, that feeling that you're really going to strut your stuff, just brushing against your partner on the stairs, you know, that with that, with that tantalising little promise of something coming in a minute or later, that's sex. It can be so many things. I mean, what's going on inside your head, sex? I mean, obviously, some people will find this really annoying to hear that, but also... Is it? Really? Well, I don't know, because they'll be like, oh, be honest, you know, sex is the stuff that you do in the bedroom. And oh, when, be honest? You know, no, well, no, no, I, I'm saying what some people would say, but I think this is a much more healthy way to look at sex, because firstly, you'll have a lot more of it if you do Definitely. this. I, I can't remember who it was that said that, but they said if you expand your definition of sex, that means you'll have more of it. But also, just because of what you said there, I think the previous idea of virginity historically has been when a man has sex with a woman and it's when the penis goes in the vagina. And that's historically been the idea. But like you say, that discounts well, lesbians, gay people, um, all sorts of people. And it discounts all the other stuff that you do around that. You know, there's some people that say, oh, I can't have uh, penis and vagina sex because of my religion. Mm. But I will do anal. I will go down on them. They will go down on me, all that sort of stuff, which seems insane because those are all extremely sexual acts and i think some people would definitely argue in some ways more intimate some mm. people you know like going down someone or third base or whatever that in some ways feels a lot more intimate third base degree really what i don't know I'm, I'm talking to our american listeners they'll know what i mean oh, okay well i'm trying i'm trying to be what's the word you know you don't want to is be that too what they call it the time. third base they call it yeah third base dude and then you know home run that's what they shout when no when they when they've when they've had penis and vagina sex they'll shout home run okay and i mean there, there are other there are other elements to virginity as well so um a lot of it is about penetration of the hymen you know the the yeah. membrane that covers the opening to uh the vagina and and there there is a a whole kind of mystique around that and you know it has to be broken on your wedding night and you have to bleed mm. um and for mm. a lot of people it's already broken or it and it may or may not have bled and it's also that it um, can stretch. I mean, it's, mm. if you if you were to get a mirror and, and crouch down and have a little look down there, ladies and people with a vagina, um, you'll find there is a there is a, a sort of high there is there is there is a jagged kind of edge around the edge the edge of the vagina where you where your hymen was. Or you may see some skin there, and so a lot of people is there's, there's, they used to say you stretch it through horse riding. So oh, don't ride mm. horses because you won't be a virgin. But 
it doesn't really matter. In the olden days, and still in some places, I think, after your wedding night, you had to hang your sheets out of the window to prove there was blood on them. Oh my to God. prove that you'd been deflowered, as they call it, deflowered. But like you say, I, I, there's loads of people who don't bleed the first no. time. Yeah. Okay. And this is, this is important to say. And so people, some people might not know what we're talking about. And I, I hate to do this again because I've already done one euphemism earlier about the home run third base thing. But when we're talking about the hymen, we are talking about the act of like popping the cherry. I know that sounds... <laughs> popping the cherry. I, I know. I hate pop. to say that. I hate to say it, but it's what people say and it's what some people will only know it by. And it so, doesn't pop. Exactly. Well, this is the thing. So isn't it... It's not a wall. It's not a It's not a cherry. It, it's it's on the walls of the vagina, right? It's something called the hymen and it's... And it's, it's protection across the opening to the vagina. And some people say that it harkens back to really prehistoric times when we were in water... Oh, right. And it protected the vagina from having water going in and out or something. I don't know how true that is, but I've read it, mm. read about it. It doesn't, it doesn't have much of a function. So it protect, and it has holes in it anyway. So otherwise, mm. you you know, where would the menstrual flow go? Um, yeah, so you yeah. have to have it for period. And if people have a completely intact hymen, then they have to have it dealt with because otherwise, cause it, because the menstrual flow backs up. Behind it. Oh, after t- if if they have it for too long. No, if yeah, if if they have if they have no, if they have a hymen that doesn't have any little perforations in it to allow oh, the menstrual right, right, blood right. through, they have mm. to have that dealt with. I mean, you you can have a, a hymen that's very thick and isn't penetrated by intercourse or horse riding or wherever it is, or mm. stretching in any, and then then you can have it stretched medically or removed medically. But there are all sorts of there are all sorts of things. I mean, it's so important to some people and some cultures that people have 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 surgery to create it again, or you know, as well as remove it. I'm glad that you mentioned this because we've got onto the hymen earlier than I, than I thought we would. But the, I, I looked up online what people search for when they search for virginity. What what are they what comes up? Mm. Can virginity be checked? Is there a virginity test? Can virginity be regained? Will my virginity grow back? I mean, so is this the sort of thing you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So can you test for it? Actually, you can look to see if somebody's got a hymen, but it doesn't mm. prove whether or not they've ever had sex because mm. it can disappear for all sorts of reasons. So it doesn't really prove anything. And can it be regained? Will it grow back? No. Yeah, it's so funny that that's one of the like top things that's written on here. It's like, well, my virginity get grow well, like back. A second what does that mean? Tooth, like a but, but also, it's get rid of my milk tooth, and then my proper yeah, exactly. virginity will grow. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand. Like, I mean, if they're talking about the hymen, may, like maybe they might think that act could regrow. Obviously, it doesn't. But they might think that. But like, just the question: Will my virginity grow back? Is the cutest thing I've ever read in the world. And your hymen is not your virginity. Your hymen is your hymen. Mm. Your virginity yeah. is an as a behave. Virginity is a behaviour. You've either had some kind of sex or you haven't. And you you can mm. be a virgin with anything, really, can't you? You could be a virgin. You know, the first time you masturbate, the first time you you know go to first base the first mm-hmm. time you know all of mm-hmm. those things for anal sex you know virgins um mm-hmm. the, you, you, whatever you want to call it it's 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 um it, it 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 has less cultural significance for us here and now than it used to but for some people mm-hmm. it still has quite a lot of invested interest mm, exactly mm. okay so let's say though that because what, what i think what we're saying is essentially is Virginity is a is a sort of social construct that was made however long ago. Mm. Um, it pertains to heterosexual couples, and the the sort of quote unquote test that you do is uh, all based around the hymen back in the day. Which, like you say, all of that is insane and stupid. However, virginity to a lot of people still means a lot, and they will think virginity, you know, whether they're uh, gay, straight. Um, lesbian whatever they will whatever it is that they deem their virginity to be losing it is still a big deal so i was wondering if we could do a little bit of a checklist how how can they prepare themselves for virginity we go through a few things and like and your first time well again it's 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 again a a sort of a social construct um Mm. in 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 as much as uh you, you know the first time's supposed to be special you know mm, that so even mm. if you don't believe even if you don't get buy into the hymen nonsense 
then you may well buy into the idea that it's special. And the the mm. idea, virgins, historically, are young girls, mm. young unmarried women. So it isn't really, so they are sort of damsels, if you like. Then mm. it's not, they, it isn't even to do with whether or not you've had sex uh, historically. And similarly, the idea that sex the first time should be special and with the person, with the one, with the person that you're always going to be with, that's that's a big deal. But also there's a big deal around culturally, around getting it out of the way and doing it at, by a certain age. You should have done it by a yeah. certain age or there's something wrong with you. These are all ideas that have come along and that aren't really very helpful to anybody I guess both of us would be saying you have you have any kind of sex, whether it's penetrative or not, when you feel ready to do it, not not mm. when you think, oh, I'm 18, I should have done it by now or whatever. All of those are really good points. I think those are two things that I've written down for because I, I made a little checklist of things that I thought would be helpful to say. And so I think one of those that you've, you've said there is is right. The, some people think that if you lose your virginity with someone, even if you're with them together, you'll be tied together forever. Mm. You know, there'll be some sort of magical bond. It needs to be with the right person. It needs to be with the right person in as much of you need to feel comfortable and safe with them. Mm. You know, obviously, consent is obviously top of the list, but also safety with them. Can you talk to them, this person that you're going to lose it with, openly and honestly about anything and, and in the whole situation? Do you feel safe with them? Are they consenting? Are you consenting? And under that consent thing, it comes down to what you just said again, which is do I feel like I am ready for this and I want to do this? And it's not based on this idea that we've got to get laid before college. You can't go to college without getting laid. Like the number of American films, I say just American films, but a number I of films that are based know on... that Donald Duck felt that way. I can't do the Donald Duck voice. You just did this, it. You, you think that Donald Duck sounds like this? I sound more like Goofy. <laughs> One of um, them. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you shouldn't be coerced but either by yourself or by anybody else. And you also shouldn't be mm. drunk. Having alcohol means that you're, you're not going to experience in the same way because your, your senses are dulled and also you may not be consenting mm, sufficiently mm. if you're if you've been drinking but people yeah. sometimes do have a drink to relax themselves and then that makes it a little bit more difficult to um say yeah this was truly consent i mean ideally mm. you'd be in a relationship where you've thought about it you've had some sort of sex previously and you you've built up to this point Rather mm. than you search around for someone at a party and just do it. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of having the, you know, a sort of a, a, a good experience rather than an experience. But, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not judging people who have, have it off at a party and, you know, that's... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's probably half of my friends from school, to be fair. Yeah, you know, I'm not. That's I'm, how I'm absolutely, for them. I'm, yeah, 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 and it's yeah. it's it's something that lots of people do. So there's no way you can say, oh, well, that's different or or not okay. Of course it is. Mm. It's fine. But just if you, but it just depends on what you want. And there is no hurry. There is actually no hurry. You're creating yeah. the hurry in your own mind. So, yeah. um, and you you have to not buy into all the Disney stuff. You have to not buy it. Well, I, mean, I don't suppose that Disney films are sitting down and saying, hey. Look, when you have sex, you do you know, penis and vagina sex, you will you will sim simultaneously orgasm. But some of the films they've made do give that impression. And in mm. fact, most media gives the impression that when you have penis and vagina sex, you will orgasm through or women will orgasm through intercourse. And most don't, especially not the first time. You know, you, mm, you actually mm. have to know one another's bodies reasonably well. Mm. It's a little bit harder for women to orgasm than it is for men. So I guess, you know, if, if you want to have a sexual experience as well as an experience, you probably want to be reasonably familiar with one another's bodies. Mm, exactly. I mean, that's another thing that I wrote down. Don't think orgasms are the goal, as particularly the first time. And that goes for men and, and women mm. in this situation. Like, you put it perfectly. You probably won't. And there's no point in putting that pressure on it. I mean, we're always telling people, even people in long-term relationships, you're always telling them, don't think about orgasm as the goal. The goal is to have a good time. And that may come as a result of that. But if if you're searching for that end goal, particularly this early on, if you're trying to lose your virginity, then I even hate saying lose your virginity. But anyway, sorry. We're, 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 we're buying careless, into a social contract. Careless. Yeah. It, it sounds careless, I'm doesn't careless. it? That language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It yeah, sounds yeah. like, oh God, I left well, it on the bus. Well, exactly. Or you've lost Shit. something. It should. It should. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I left my virginity on the bus. Thing. What do you think about this? We've done so. We've done the one. We've done consent. We've done safety. Um, build up to it with. Obviously, you said before it's like you know if you're in a relationship, that's really good as well. Like you guys will know each other's bodies better. You'll know each other better. Again, comes under the safety and consent thing, but also in the moment, foreplay really important. If you just if you just dive straight into it, no one's going to be ready. And I mean, if this is might... the first time you've exposed your genitals to another person, I would think it would be really nerve wracking. To, yeah, to, yeah. For most people, I mean, not for most mm. people. I'm not, you know. I mean, if if you're not nerve wracked and if you're really relaxed, good on you. But it's quite easy to understand that people might be anxious, yeah. and it's a weird experience. It's the first time you've done it. There's air getting around your bits, and that may not have happened before. You know, because you mm. you get in the shower, out the shower, put your knickers on. You know, you don't know what that's mm. like necessarily, and it's especially not somebody else looking at you down there or touching you down there. It's all weird stuff. Mm. Mm. And and you might be nervous because there's lots of stories about how how intercourse hurts and things like that. Yes. And can I just put that out there? Does it have to hurt? No. 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 Um, do you, and, and we've already covered the fact that you don't have to bleed. No. And if you're sufficiently relaxed, it should be okay. And some people who are really, really on it, they, I mean, in an ideal world, the first time you have intercourse, you should be familiar with one another's genital to genital contact. So what I would advise people to do if they're having, going to have sexual intercourse for the first time, play with the penis around your vulva, get used mm. to, you know, maybe stimulate the clitoris with the penis and see what that feels like. I mean, if you wear a condom, if you're, you know, if there's a risk of pregnancy and so on but do that so you get used to that feeling and maybe put a bit of pressure around the vulva at some point so you get used to that feeling of it of the penis entering but don't Mm. go in and Mm. just do that several times until you feel really relaxed and then one day it will just happen maybe or Mm. you'll say okay it's today maybe use lube to make it easier to make it slide in more easily but don't do it unless you're really aroused if you don't feel really aroused and ready don't do it in an ideal world the the woman will already have climaxed once and then if you go straight in afterwards that should be very relaxed and and not painful top tip Mm. Yeah, top tip. Top tip. There you go. But 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 you know, I mean, I think that I think there should be more to it than it, there is for a lot of people. And you know, mm. when you think about it, you can have amazing, incredible, fantastic, mind blowing sex without having intercourse. And in fact, intercourse for yeah, most well, people is a bit disappointing. Mm. Yeah, and exactly. if it's you're sorry, I'm really warming to my theme now because I'm thinking, say you're friends and you say, oh well, we're friends, so maybe we should do this, and then they mm. and then maybe the guy comes straight away or something like that, and then is mm. really really horrifically embarrassed, or 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 the the woman saying this hurts, oh, and mm. that's really embarrassing or whatever, or the and the person feels oh well, god, my lack of experience is exposed or whatever, then they may never talk to one another again. And mm. as a sex therapist, I have seen lots of couples who have been apart for years, who had ha, had a fumbly experience, were so embarrassed they didn't speak to one another, even though they were really into one another. They met up again years later, and got over it, and and yeah, 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 yeah. reconnected. But you could see, you could some people will never do that reconnecting, and they, they mm. they're potentially throwing away a great relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit chuffed that you've said that because right here I've got something may go wrong, all the things that you've mentioned, and that is okay. You know, we've we've said this checklist or whatever and all these things you can do to prepare, but at the same time, you know, it's understandable that you'll be anxious this first time and something something might not go right, but that's not the be-all and end-all and that's not it. That's not over. And especially if you've done the other things on the checklist and you feel safe and you can talk to each other and all that sort of stuff, then... It's fine, yeah, and uh, and you're going to be okay. But that's not the way people see it, is it? They they see themselves as being good at it, and there's a sort of belief that you're yeah. innately a good or a bad lover. And I think mm. how how you perform, if you want to call it that, depends on your mood, depends on where you mm. are at the time, depends on whether or not you're anxious, whatever, whatever, and how mm. relaxed you are, and how well you know one another. And it's really there is, I mean, you don't expect to be born walking, talking, and and, and making a souffle. So mm. why would you expect to be able to 
you, you know, do, do have have wonderful sex. The first in, sexual intercourse, do make the distinction. The first time you do it, mm. or any kind of sex, actually. I mean, when yeah. you think about kissing, oh my god, your first kiss. I mean, remember oh my, my first god. proper kiss. I got bitten to death. <laughs> I came out of it covered what? in bruises, love bites, all across. You know. Oh Jesus! And was that po- that was that wasn't purposeful was it no, do you think no yeah i okay, was just right, kissing right. i was kissing the way you do in the movies you want to pucker up yeah, yeah 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 and um he had other ideas which i didn't understand or know about and it wasn't until oh. i talked to my friends you know afterwards they said was he trying to get his tongue in and i was like well i don't know and they went oh he was yeah. he was and oh, i was like oh do people do that ooh, ooh. oh mate my yeah, I mean, talking about first kisses, mine was. I remember, I yeah, my my girlfriend at the time. We were really quite young, to be fair. Anyway, my girlfriend at the time, she was like, "I've seen my parents do this. You know, let's try this oh my God. kissing out." And so, so not like like the movies, you know. So, and I remember we did it, and it was just the most, the most horrible. There was part. There's a big part of it. I was like, "This is really exciting. I want to. I want to kiss this person." But then when we did it, the actual because we were both doing it so badly. To be fair. I was disgusted by myself and by and by the way we were doing it, and I was like, and it made me feel physically ill. Um, so I mean, maybe that's not a great side. But what I'm saying is, now I enjoy kissing a lot. But what I'm saying is, that first time, if I'd just been like, "Whoa, this isn't for me," and cut it all off, exactly, you know, and that was insane. just a kiss. So that was just a kiss, yeah. Um, and yeah. so, so my vir- virgin kiss, my first kiss was was mm. not great. Um, yeah. And nor was yours. So you you, you just terrible. wonder how many people. Maybe it runs in the family, but it, it makes you wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so it is inherent. Oh no, it's hereditary. No, Shit. no it's not. I um, mean, but it makes you wonder how. I mean, you know, most people probably don't have the best experience ever, and no. it's and it probably is going to. If you if you're after a good experience, then probably get to know the person first. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a really good piece of advice as well. We've said all this checklist of stuff, but the number of people who will say to you, they'll be like, "How was it?" and they'll go. Yeah, it was nice. It was comfortable. Or they'll go, oh, it was terrible. Mm. You know, so not many people are going to come away and go, that was mind-blowing sex. Oh, my God. And that, that's almost, I'm going to say, never going to happen. Well, do you know something? I ask people about their first se- their first time a lot. I mean, mm. I do it every day, you know. And the, yeah, the, yeah. the most common... <laughs> and I- that's not even at work. That's mental. You're just a crazy person. <laughs> It is at work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, um, good. <laughs> I ask the question every day at work, not I do it every day at work. Anyway, so most people say, I was glad to get it out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Get it out That's of the way. That's what they say. Yeah. That's what they say. They don't say, oh, it was lovely. We felt so close. Yeah. They don't say, oh, it was terrible. You know, I wish I hadn't done it. They say, I was glad mm. to get it out of the way. And that's that's yeah, as exactly. much as you can get out of people around yeah. that, which is yeah. not not ideal. Do you know what I wish I could do? Is I could wish I could I wish sometimes I could just grab young people and, and just say to them, guys, for God's sake, I know it seems like a huge deal right now, but it really isn't. Like fast forward to now, I've met so many people. I people always talk about this because of the podcast. So we talk about these sorts of things all the time. And the number of people who say, I lost my virginity at this age, you know, I lost my virginity at this age, I only lost my virginity the other day. I mean, I'm twenty six years old at the moment. You know, these are people who are losing it all different and ages. And when it happens to you, Diggs, I would give you one piece of advice. <laughs> yeah. Do not have any kind of sex with a mouthful of peanuts. Why? Well, what? Think about it. I can't. Well, would you want to snog somebody with a mouthful of peanuts? or have I them... once had a girl refuse to kiss me because I'd eaten tuna earlier that day. <laughs> So, you know, that's fine. Maybe that was just her excuse. But what I'm saying is to these people, like... When you get older, you realise none of this stuff matters, yeah. and we're all on an even keel. And it, and honestly, you know, you just you have a good time with people. People are great. People are nice. You just aren't, all this stuff just slowly just floats away out the window. You don't even realise it. You turn twenty six, and you sort of think, why did I ever care about any mm. of this sort of stuff? Mm. So go at your own pace. Do what feels right, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, we've been talking about virginity for ages. Are there any lasting thoughts? Because I think we should let the people. And we can move on. We can get some of these questions answered in part two. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd be interested actually to hear what um, listeners think about it. You know, I'd yeah. be quite if they if they wanted to let us know. I'd be interested to see how they they found it, or or indeed whether they find this good or bad advice. Yes, if we've missed anything out, or if we you think mm. we've got good or bad advice, yeah, please let us know. I'll do a little post on our Instagram. You can go and find us at our Instagram. We're at Real Sex Ed Pod, and just let us know there what we're we missing out. Also, how was your first experience? I know that's a quite a big 
thing to ask. But if you just say good or bad or whatever, it would be nice to see because I'm sure a lot of people, like we said... Oh, you could do a poll. We could do a poll. We'll do a poll. Well, let's do a poll. Let's do a poll. Excellent. Okay, we'll go and find that whilst we have a quick break and we'll be back in part two with your questions and more right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the Real Sex Education. This is part two of the show where we put the questions you sent into us via email, podcast at hatrick.com, and DMing us on Twitter and Instagram at Real Sex Ed Pod with your sex and relationship conundrums for mum to answer. Mum, are you ready for your first question? I'm braced. This one is from Anonymous, who says <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, Kate and Diggory. I'm 30 and I have been in a relationship for 12 years. We bought a house together a few years ago and since then I've been feeling quite anxious about the commitment this means and I'm now at a point where I feel like I missed on being single in my 20s and I really want the opportunity to meet and get with slash sleep with other people. We have discussed this but I'm unsure about how to move past it because it feels awkward to live together whilst doing this, but it's hard to live apart from a financial perspective and telling friends and family. I think about this a lot of the time and I've been feeling more attracted to other people. I don't want to live with regrets around it all, so I don't know what to do. Wow. Any advice? Mm. It's really difficult to know what's going on here, whether whether it's that the there really is a strong a strong sort of feeling of missing out or whether that would have happened if the relationship was continuing to be exciting what would happen if they did separate i mean that's hard to know mm. as well would would the relationship survive them separating and would the relationship survive just him having having other relationships as well so if they're going to do that, if they were going to open up, they'd need very, 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 very clear boundaries around it. Because mm. it sounds like this person is writing in and asking for permission to just do it. Well, I think, so uh, just to say as well, so this is a, a woman writing in and it's about her partner and they've got a house together. But it mm. sounds like the, the impression I got is when they said, we've spoken about this and you know part of, part of the stumbling block of doing it is it's just awkward because we're living together. But mm. it feels like they're, They've talked about it and it's they're kind of happy for it to happen. Um, I'm not so sure. Well, maybe, maybe. Oh, well, there's the thing. You sort of, you think maybe not. But then maybe, could this not be a case of two people thinking, well, we've got this, we've got this issue. This has come up. As she says, she's like, I've been feeling more and more attracted to other people as it's gone on. I don't want to live with regrets. It's not that we, I want to break up with this person forever. We've got this house. We've been together for 10, 12 years or whatever it is. We're trying to make a an arrangement that works for us both i mean could that not if be the case if it's a woman and they've been in a relationship for for more than 10 years women do tend to to lose spontaneous desire within their relationships mm -hmm. within their ongoing relationships so that's normal mm. so it, i mean and it's so equally normal to look for some excitement outside of it so let's say that now instead of spontaneous desire it's responsive what does that mean and in this for this person how does she then feel desire again for a partner if, if that is what's lacking we don't know well if that is. i mean they fit people feel desire after they're aroused the the, the desire follows arousal rather than mm. the other way around and we're kind of led to believe that desire should be there first and so and so especially for women they like the circumstances to be right before they'll have sex i mean not all women but it's a kind of a, a bit of a thing they, they're not going to sort of do it unless they unless they feel aroused and ready and relaxed and all of that. So, you know, you might not look at your partner and think, oh boy, I want to kiss them. But if your partner came up to you and, you know, they looked at you in a certain way and, you, and they started kissing you and you guys were kissing and you were suddenly like, hmm, hmm, I know I do want to have sex with them. Instead mm. of looking at them thinking, boy, I want to have sex with them. It's only mm. after like they've started kissing you or whatever. Okay. I, but this does apply, should should add, this applies to about a third of men as well. And mm. then if you take them out of a, of a long relationship and put them with a new partner, then all the desire would come back. Mm. And it's really easy to assume that there's something wrong with the relationship because you don't feel the desire, when actually it's just that either the, the honeymoon period hormones have worn off or you're 
in a relationship longer than 10 years. I mean, one of the things that, that some people do is to join an agency where other people are, who are in relationships will meet up with them. So it's just sex. Mm, mm. And that works for some people really well. Um, and it's very neat if you look at it from that point of view. Mm. Where, where people have more difficulty is where they maybe know their partner is going out for a date. Yeah. And and then if you're having dates, then the chances are you're going to form a relationship. And with new relationship energy, you can be all loved up and it can be really, really difficult to be. I mean, at the best of times, it can be very hard to be around someone who's in a new relationship because they go all soppy and, yeah, um, and they're loving you know, it. and they're love. Yeah. And they're full of hormones and it's all mm. a bit difficult. And they can often think, OK, this is more real than the relationship I had before. And that's the danger. So if they're both doing it and they've agreed it and they understand it, then maybe maybe it wouldn't be as hard. But it is hard. Mm. And, and people in poly relationships do experience difficulty. I mean, there are some people who say, oh, you know, well, I'm pleased for my partner. And that's that's the ideal state that mm. you want to be pleased for them being in, an, in, in a relationship they're enjoying. But we're all human and it's hard to see. You know, mm. if that was you a few years ago and now it's someone else, that's really that really is hard. So it can threaten the relationship. And I think you have to be very clear that there is a risk of damaging the relationship permanently by doing this. Mm. Equally, some people make it work. Mm. So this is about being really clear about the rules and really clear about, you know, what you're expecting. I yeah. mean, other people, of course, bring a third person into the relationship and they, they all have sex together. There's that. Mm. But you, you need to know, are you going to tell your partner what you're doing? And are they going to be aware when you're going off on a date? Or is this going to be private? I, well, mean, I think that's really important. It's very important. I imagine with this, the fact they're already talking about it'd be awkward to live together whilst doing this. Mm. I imagine that makes it, it like, listen, I know what you're doing. I just don't want to know any of the specifics. I don't want to you know, I don't want you coming home with someone random and me having to sleep in the spare room or, or whatever. Yeah. I think that's, and to be honest, if I if I was going to do something like this, I think that's how I'd do it. I'd be like, I, you, I'm happy for you to do what you want, but I just don't want to sort of know about it, if that makes sense, which is mm. why it, I understand they're living in different places. So yeah, I think all the points you've made there are really important and great. I guess for me, what I would say is, um, what, and you've made me think about this, what are you wanting? What is it ultimately you want? Because what you mentioned before, you made that distinction between is it just sex with other people? Because I think that actually might be easier. Like you said, those agencies Ooh. and stuff, quite neat. You know, you can go out, you can do that, you can stay at someone else's, that sort of thing. And just, you know, you can do it that way. It's a bit neater. If it is go out and see other people and go through the whole rigmarole of flirting, dating, going back to theirs, spending a bit more time with them, that could get a lot more messy. Mm. Um, and that could, like you say, lead to a few more issues. But if that's what you're looking for, it might be possible. But I'm just saying that that mo won't be, I love that word, it won't be as neat. Uh, yeah, well, I would also strongly advise this person to look at what made them move in together in the first place. What was their motivation then? Because mm. the motivation then might have been, I want to play at being a grown up, which is mm. what a lot of people do. It sounds yeah. a bit pejorative saying that, but but actually an awful lot of people do feel that way. You know, I want to have a go at this, especially if their friends are doing it and they may feel left out. They may have felt left out then. Because if there are a few years down the line as well, my guess is that a lot of their friends might be having babies mm. and settling even more, making even more commitment. And that might be what's scary. Yeah. And, you know, be be really clear about what what's the difference between then and now. And, mm -hmm. and in my attitude to commitment, not to this person, then look at your attitude to the person and say, well, you know, has have we changed? Because as I am always saying, if you have a really good relationship, you might outgrow it. Mm -hmm. It might mm -hmm. allow you the you know, to feel different. And, you know, if, if you if you're really, really, really good friends with somebody, you can you can lose the sexual spark anyway, because you feel too much like family. Mm. And, you know, it feels like your, your brother and sister. And then there's no then the sexual spark goes. And then a lot of people have done all the developmental work they need to do in the relationship and they end the relationship. Mm. But 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 you don't always know that you want to end the relationship because you still feel such good friends. Mm -hmm. And society kind of says if you're friends, you shouldn't split up. But, you know, maybe maybe you should. Yeah, maybe it's what's best for you. Do you think 
that or, or do you see people this happen with a lot? Because I have friends of mine who uh, the further they get into relationships, sometimes the commitment freaks them out and they think, oh, I haven't done that thing mm. that I'm supposed to do, which is in my early to mid 20s, sleep around loads and have a good time. And they're, they're worried they're going to regret it. And a lot of them break up and do that and they have a great time. Or a lot of them break up, they go literally a month or two into it, they go, what have I done? Why am I I'm an idiot? Mm. And do you see people coming to you a lot with that? I mean, we're talking even further down the line, you know, in their 40s and 50s. Do, do people say the same thing to you? What, that they've missed out? That they've missed out. They should have been swinging from the chandeliers, 60s style. That's that's why I'm saying look back at the, look back at what, what your motivation was then. Mm. Because if your motivation has changed, you want to be thinking why it's changed. Mm. I mean, you know, if you didn't feel you were missing out then, why do you feel you're missing out now? The chances are it's not missing out. It's that there's something about this relationship or about the sex in this relationship that is a problem. Mm. Well, I mean, here we go. We bought a house together a few years ago. And since then, I've been feeling quite anxious about the commitment. I mean, I wonder whether it's that thing of, and I, I totally get this, and we talked about this before, sometimes the more you commit to someone, the more you want to pull away because yeah. you're sacrificing other things to be with them. And it sounds quite romantic and stuff, but you're also closing yourself up to other options. Unfortunately, that's the sacrifice well, of being in a relationship like this. Actually, it, what, what it's, what's even more likely is that the closer you get to somebody, the more you worry about losing them. Yeah. And the more you worry about maybe being found out, being found out that you're not the perfect person. Mm-hmm. You, you know, and if you feel a bit not good enough, then the closer you get to someone, the more likely it is they'll realise that. Mm. They'll, they'll realise that you really aren't good enough. And I mean, mm. if that's what you believe about yourself, I'm not saying, obviously, yeah. I'm not saying anybody is not good enough. Yeah. But, but some people find it really difficult to be close because of the risk it involves. So the closer mm. you are, the more you commit, the more there's a problem. And quite often when people come having had affairs, for instance, I'll say, What's happened recently? And they and they will have had a baby, got pregnant, got engaged, moved in together, mm. made some sort of commitment, some sort of financial commitment, increased their mortgage, something that puts them even closer and makes it even more dangerous to lose one another. And some people can only function in a relationship by having lots and lots of spares. As in, and, when you say spares, you, know, and you lots mean... Lots of effect, fe- spare people, other yeah, relationships. Yeah, yeah. So that if this, if the main one, which they really want, fails, then they've got a backup. Mm. So there's incre- an incredible number of reasons why people might want to go off and have, you know, other relationships. And that's not to pathologise, Diggs. It's not to pathologise what this woman is is wanting because it may well be she just genuinely just wants a bit of fun and Mm. she does feel she's missed out and that's all there is to it yeah but for anyone else listening there could be all sorts of other things going on as well about this the financial aspect living apart and friends and family do we need to worry about that because i feel like if we have said what we've said which is basically you need to do a bit more soul searching as to exactly what you need you want and Mm. yeah do you think we can just I don't think you should worry about what other people think. I mean, yeah. you know, that's probably what got you into this in the first place. It may well be that, you know, it was other people's expectations that led you to buy the house together, in which case it's understandable that you at some point you're going to push back. Mm. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, th- I think both partners need to think very carefully about how they'd feel if it was the other way around as well. Mm. And I mean, you know, if, if she wants to go off and have other relationships, how would she feel if... if he was doing it. I mean, mm. I'm assuming it's a straight relationship. But I it think may it not is. Be. That's the impression I got. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, there, there's a, there's quite a lot to think about and really is nobody else's business as well. You mm. know, it may well be as well that some time apart might work for them. You mm. know, that, that might be what they need so that they can come back fresh. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a bit tricky with this big house they bought but you know it is what it is yeah but, um, but just imagine how if you if you're feeling a huge sense of commitment the idea that you don't have to feel it anymore and that you can start again might be fantastic and they mm. might even get on better living separately some people do that's a that's a great point that's a great point mm. all right our next question is from a guy who says, I'm annoyed at the stereotype that men always want to have sex. I think it makes my girlfriend think that I don't find her attractive when I'm not initiating sex all the time. And it also means that she doesn't ever initiate with me. Which is actually funny hearing him say this because of what we've just spoken about in the previous question. Um, But that's all they've written. 
that's all there is. Mm. Is that mm. something that you observe? Oh, yeah. And quite often what, what's interesting is that you get this sort of high libido, low libido kind of dynamic where one partner says, well, I've, I'm, you know, I am always up for it. Mm. Um, or, or, you know, there's, there's this assumption that I'm always up for it. And it sounds in this case as if the woman is wanting the man to prove to her how much he cares about her by wanting to have sex with her mm. and that she's finding this validating and reassuring but expecting him to always be initiating and being cross if he doesn't doesn't give her space to experience you know her own desire and to come on to him Mm. Um, so that's so she's missing out because of it but generally in these cases whether it's the man or the woman who says I I, you you know I I want you to show me you care about me whether that's because they claim to have a high libido or whether it's because they just think it's you know the right thing to do or the thing you know men men are always up for it so why aren't you finding me attractive Mm. this is about their ability to regulate their emotions and it's really, I have to say, her problem mm. to deal with. And, you know, I would be saying this to to clients in this situation. And, and in fact, this is what sex therapy, because it assumes that, that couples will have expectations about initiation, desire, what, you know, being up for it, have frequency and all of those things. In the kind of sex therapy I do, we take all those elements out because the Mm. problems are so common. So what we would do is say, okay, you do the experiments, the sexual exercises, whatever it is that we set for you at the times that are set. So you diarize it you and you turn up in the place you're supposed to be at the time you're supposed to be there. So there's no initiation. There's no question Mm. of who does it and who's doing more, who's doing less. You just go, you just turn up. And if you're finding it difficult because you, you're wondering what your partner's thinking or you're thinking that they're not showing enough interest, we ask couples to try and be as poker-faced as they can. I mean, with the, with the initial exercises, that's not as difficult as it sounds. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, but not to talk about their experience, not to talk about whether they enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it, which it removes any blame. It removes any kind of little snarky remarks it just that nothing like that can happen and nor can anybody saying oh this is wonderful this was amazing because then you put pressure on the other person to make it that amazing again Mm. so all of that is taken away so what we're trying to do is help people as well to self-regulate because that can be quite stressful when you don't know what the other person's thinking are they liking this or not and just concentrate on their own experience. And when they do that, eventually they learn, actually, it's fine. If there's a problem, we can we can talk about it, but with no hidden agendas, no worrying about what, what you saying you have a need will do to me or mm. what my needs will do to you. That's all taken out of it. So this feeling of needing to be validated is so common that it's a regular part of sex therapy. We expect people to have these difficulties Mm. so so what what so when I say it's her problem um that's not me saying oh well it's her problem go off and deal with it it's me Mm -hmm. saying this is quite normal Mm. she might need some help to manage those negative things and you can immediately make somebody feel better by just simply saying that things are good at other times you know just say isn't this nice aren't we having a lovely time together Mm. this is great I love you so much you look great you know things which make somebody feel good Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, it, th- there are lots of ways of, of reassur- being reassuring yeah. without it needing to involve intercourse. Definitely. I mean, I mean, this is a strange example, but I've been watching Love Island lately. And oh, uh, <laughs> no, but obviously in that program, because they all sleep in the same room and stuff, you know, there's less chances for them to have sex. But but they're, because they're all together at the same in the villa at the same time, they can't really go anywhere. Their relationships are quite intense because they have to get to mm. know these people really quickly and they and stuff. But there's sometimes people use this the wrong way and they'll say really sweet things, but way too early on, like on a first date. And, you know, they're clearly just trying to make the other person like them more. But there's some mm. really sweet moments where you're thinking, well, you guys can't, you know, be that intimate with each other and that one on one and that sort of thing. So there's moments where they go, oh, you know what, my, we're having a really nice time. And our time in the villa together has been made so much better because you're here. And you just think, that's cute as hell. And it's mm. stuff like that where, yeah, maybe you can show that validation and that love and appreciation in other ways. Maybe they should do the, the love language test. 
and work it out yeah, that way. You can do love, love languages and and and, um, and and to explain to anyone who doesn't know, love yeah. languages are the way you show love. So somebody might show love through buying gifts or mm-hmm. by doing things for the other person, acts of or, service, or physically, yes, or, or physical through touch. physical touch or whatever mm. it is. So we when we all have different Words ways of, of doing things. Worth of, oh God, you know them all, all off do, my heart. We've don't got you? one left: quality time. Quality time, there you go. Yeah, so those are the five. And you can, there's like, there's all these bogus tests online that you can do. But I do think, and you know, they're a bit of fun, but I do think you will see some of yourself in these tests mm-hmm. and you will think to yourself, yeah, that does fit. For, for me, acts of service and um, gift giving are right at the bottom and vying at the top, all for top spot, but they're really close together, are the other three quality time. Uh, words of affirmation and physical touch and I think that's exactly right for me so actually you know the test that I did was a little fun online thing but it, it probably does show that is how I show affection and so mm. uh, it does kind of work and I guess maybe that that might work for you guys here as well but if you're talking about words of affirmation as well if you do say um this is nice about anything I mean you know you could be sitting having a cup of tea together and you say this is nice mm. both of you will get an endorphin hit so the more you do that kind of thing, the more your partner will feel positive and good about the relationship mm. because they, when they're with you, they keep having these these lovely warm feelings, mm. and they, you know, which are which are subtle. They may not, you know, they're not aware of a sudden rush of love or whatever, but they're aware of feeling okay. And that's mm. I feel better when I'm with you. That kind of thing, mm. and. And it's often because somebody is is doing that very positive thing. And it, where it's totally different. Somebody sitting there saying, this is nice, is so different to somebody sitting there going, oh, what, you you know, you left your pants on the floor again. Mm. And that kind of constant narrative. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Which isn't going to make anyone feel good. No, absolutely. I mean, mm. on the flip side of that, though, I have definitely been the one to, in relationships, I think, to be like, when things aren't going so well, I've been like, oh, but this is nice, right? Um and in that in that scenario, it will just piss them off because it's. Oh, you're it's talking not nice. about looking for reassurance, though. Yeah, looking for re- this is nice, right? Is a <laughs> is a real bit. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, Whereas, that's true. Whereas, <laughs> oh, this is nice. Is it comes from a place where somebody is a hundred percent secure in that belief? Yeah, this is nice. This is a mm. nice thing that's happening, and and the other person, if the other person disagrees, the miserable git, then um, you know they. <laughs> <laughs> Your face. <laughs> wow. Okay. Shots I mean, fired. You know, it's it's hard when somebody's saying. I mean, if if you, I mean, I can see why someone would disagree if you say this is nice, right, and they yeah. they don't feel it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But if somebody's enjoying themselves, then then you can only say, well, yeah, if, you know, you, that's your experience. Good for you. And I'm getting a little bit of that fallout as well. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, I think that's what we've got time for. But please do keep sending in your questions if you have any more for us. And remember, they don't need to be personal to you. I mean, if there's something or you general. see or yet yeah, a general or a topic um, you'd like us to discuss, that email again, podcast at hatch.com. And our Twitter and Instagram accounts are both at Real Sex Ed Pod. Mum, thank you very much for what has been another lovely episode. Thank you, Diggs. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week for some more Real Sex Education. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Campbell. The show is produced by Diggory Waite, and the executive producer is Claire Broughton. The Real Sex Education is a hat-trick podcast. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between Diggory Waite and his mother, accredited sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by, but otherwise unrelated to, the TV show Sex Education. But yes, Diggory does wish his mother was played by Gillian Anderson. 